Thank you, Bob, and thank you all for uh, inviting me here. So when I was in uh, medical school and residency, my um, mentors at the time recommended to try to figure out what you're interested in, you should try to find out who you'd like to emulate, the mentors you have clinically or with their research. And so during my uh, time as a resident here, uh, Dr. Harrington was that person. I was fortunate to have him as my attending during my intern year and as a senior resident as well um, on the general medicine service at, at Harborview. And so I continuously uh, sought his guidance. When I left residency, as Dr. Harrington mentioned, I went to the CDC given my interest in public health and global health, but I continued to miss clinical medicine. And so when I um, was trying to think about what are the specific aspects of clinical medicine I, I missed. Um, it was a number of things, the longitudinal care of, of patients, end of life discussions, um, uh, the interaction you can have with patients and their families. And so this was almost eight or nine years ago, I sent um, Dr. Harrington an email just talk, asking him for his guidance. And uh, I still remember him returning an email saying that, um, you know, I think you'd be happy in clinical medicine, um, but why waste your career um, choosing something where you're pushing poisons as opposed to um, <laughs> take, taking care of patients with HIV, where you'll get all of those things you seek. You'll get to take care of patients and develop a longitudinal relationship with them. You'll have end of life discussions. You have uh, patient engagement. Um, but he said, at the end of the day, you should do what makes you feel um, most passionate about. And if you be an oncologist, you should choose that. But I'm sure after a number of years, you'll recognize that at the heart or at the root of all these cancers lies a virus. Um, and so that was the, the guidance he gave me. And so um, my interests actually have, uh, have bridged the two, infectious diseases and, uh, and oncology. And so for the purpose of this talk, I have three primary objectives. And then we will have hopefully uh, plenty of time to ask questions. But at the, for the objectives of the talk are to describe the epidemiology of HIV-associated malignancies, to characterize treatment factors associated um, among patients with HIV, and review both novel and standard treatment options for HIV-infected patients. One thing um, I'd also like to add, it's been, uh, I feel very lucky to, to be here, to return to the University of Washington at the Fred Hutch under the mentorship of uh, colleagues like Dr. Harrington and also Dr. Virginia Brody, who runs the HIV clinic here at the Madison Clinic, and uh, Corey Casper, who is my research mentor at the Fred Hutch. And so Corey actually shared with me this, uh, this cover of Life Magazine from 1962. And you can notice um, this was you know, almost over 50 years ago that uh, there's new evidence that cancer may be infectious, but no one thought too much about this when they saw Marilyn Monroe with a skinny dip you'll never see on the screen. So I think this was sort of uh, ignored, unfortunately. And the relationship between cancer and infectious disease wasn't really uh, uh, well described or continued to focus in that area. It came back in the early 80s. And actually, you all know this better than I do, but really the, what heralded, one of the things that heralded the HIV epidemic was the identification of gay men in New York who developed Kaposi's sarcoma, a malignancy that really is uh, extremely uncommon in immunocompetent individuals. And so the thought was something is reducing the immune system of these individuals. This was prior to the identification that uh, HIV was the cause of AIDS. And the relationship between cancer and oncology, I think, or oncology and infectious disease, and in particular HIV, goes one step even further. It's actually, um, we take some credit for this in the oncology field as it's really oncologic therapy that resulted in the cure of the, the Berlin patient um, with, who had HIV. And it was a really, uh, um, it was a nice piece of clinical work that really led to this. This is a patient, as you all know, uh, Timothy Brown, who had acute myeloid leukemia. And one of the treatments for acute myeloid leukemia after um, 
combination chemotherapy is a bone marrow transplant. And we had heard, and there, it was some known that there are some folks who have resistance to HIV, those folks who harbor a CCR delta mutation. And so when this patient, Timothy Brown, who was residing in Berlin, was actually uh, grew up in Seattle, but when he was in Berlin and his oncologist recognized that he needed a transplant, the thought was, well, maybe if we can find a donor who had this mutation, the CCR5 delta mutation, they were able to identify such a donor, fortunately, and he was transplanted. And he's thus far really the only person who's cured of uh, his HIV. So again, a relationship between HIV and oncology. So in large part, given the successes of the treatments for HIV, primarily antiretroviral therapy and other therapies, the number of persons living with AIDS, in addition to the number of persons living with HIV, continues to increase. We're seeing this in, in all age groups, especially the, the middle age group. This was an article that was published um, about a month ago in the New England Journal of Medicine by two colleagues who were at the um, National Cancer Institute in the HIV AIDS malignancy branch. Tom Aldrich, who is the co-author of this paper, actually recently joined us at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutch. But just this uh, shows the, the increasing um, prevalence of persons living with AIDS. And we're also seeing an increase in the cancers among persons with AIDS. So in the early uh, part of the epidemic in 91 through 96, we saw a lot, the, there was a disproportionate number of AIDS defining cancers. Those are certain subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, invasive cervical cancer, and Kaposi's sarcoma. Now, um, in the more recent uh, past, we're seeing less of those AIDS-defining cancers and more non-AIDS-defining cancers. And that we'll talk about as well, but it's primarily a function of, of aging. And the real change in terms of the proportions of the AIDS-defining cancers and the non-AIDS-defining cancers really occurred in the mid-90s after the introduction of effective protease inhibitors. So HIV and cancer, it can increase, the HIV itself can increase the risk of certain cancers up to 3,000 times. It is a leading cause of death. Um, in the beginning part of the epidemic, it was uh, HIV-associated um, disease that caused uh, death, and now cancer is uh, the leading cause of death, a leading cause of death. And there's an estimated 8,000 causes or cases of cancer a year, and this is roughly 50% more than what we would expect in the general population. Again, we separate them by AIDS-defining cancer and non-AIDS-defining cancers. And the AIDS-defining cancers, again, are Kaposi sarcoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and invasive cervical cancer. And these are all cancers that are associated with another cancer-causing virus, uh, HHV8 or Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, for the KS, um, Epstein-Barr virus, for primarily for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but certain types are also associated with uh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, and the human papilloma virus for cervical cancer. And then the non-AIDS-defining cancers are anal cancer, liver cancer, Hodgkin lymphoma, and lung cancer. For anal cancer, liver cancer, and Hodgkin lymphoma, those are also caused, um, have a, a virus that's causing the cancer. Again, HPV, the hepatitides, and EBV for those three cancers, respectively. These, all these non-AIDS-defining cancers, there's an increased risk among patients with HIV. We also see other cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. Those are more common as we age, but those are not necessarily disproportionately increased among patients with, with HIV. In some term, some refer to those cancers as incidental cancers rather than the non-AIDS defining, non defining cancers. Also the AIDS defining cancers, those three typically we see, um, they're more commonly seen shortly after a diagnosis. Sometimes we see at Harborview, the last time I was on service last month, a patient whose uh, 
first diagnosis of HIV was during his admission for, um, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. In the non-AIDS defining cancers, we see them more commonly <coughs> five years after their diagnosis. And this is an article uh, from, this is data from a variety of articles from about five years ago or eight years ago. And this is 2010 data where there was an estimated 8,000 cases of cancer among patients uh, with HIV. Again, the, the AIDS-defining malignancies, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, and cervical cancer. Right now, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the, the one that's responsible for the, it has the highest proportion of all cancers in HIV. Nearly 20% of all cancers that we see in patients with HIV are due to systemic non-Hodgkin lymphoma. A much smaller percentage have uh, CNS lymphoma. 12% of patients have, Kap have Kaposi sarcoma, or Kaposi sarcoma is responsible for 12% of cancers in HIV positive patients, and cervical cancer is just 1%. Now this data is for the United States. If we look in other parts of the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, it's very much different. Kaposi sarcoma and cervical cancer are, in Uganda, the two leading causes of cancer that we see in Uganda. Lung cancer, anal cancer, and hepatocellular carcinoma also are responsible for 11, 10, and 5% of the, the total burden of all cancers. There was a study by colleagues at the um, NIH who looked at the excess cancer burden among HIV, uh, HIV infected patients or people in the United States. They looked at SEER data and they looked at some other um, cancer registry data. And it's hard to interpret this graph so clearly, but they tried to, for different risk groups, so men who have sex with men, heterosexual male, heterosexual females, IV drug users, or other, they tried to calculate the, the excess burden and what they, how they did their calculation. I mean, they did some fancy statistics, but basically they looked at the expected number of cases they would see in the general population and they calculated the number of cases they saw in the HIV population and calculated the, the excess burden. And we'll talk about some of these specific ones um, as we talk about some of the particular cancers later. And so why do patients with HIV have an increased incidence of, of cancer? There's probably a lot of different reasons. One is uh, likely due to immune dysregulation and such immune dysregulation likely affects the way the body can um, control oncogenic viruses. As uh, we mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of, uh, a number of the AIDS, defi all of the AIDS defining cancers and the a number of the non-AIDS defining cancers are caused by a virus. Um, and so the body uh, may be unable to suppress the, um, or control the oncogenic viruses and also immune exhaustion. Our T cells may not be able to uh, perform properly with the same quality as someone who is not HIV um, infected. In addition, uh, chronic antigen dysregulation, cytokine dysregulation, which may change the milieu, uh, proliferative signaling. There's some thought that HIV, the virus itself, directly leads to angiogenesis, which ca can cause certain cancers. And then environmentally, there's a higher percentage or prevalence of smoking among uh, the HIV positive population. And so we see a, a disproportionate increase in the number of uh, smoking associated cancers, primarily lung cancer. But fortunately, we are seeing the incidence of cancer um, go down. This, uh, this is a Swedish study that looked at three different periods of time 1985 to 1996, which was referred to as the pre art era, 1997 to 2001, the early art era, and 2002 to 2006, the sort of modern art era, the relatively modern art era. And for both men and women, the, uh, and men, the incidents really, this early incidence, this disproportionate um, um, between the, the men and women were really driven by Kaposi sarcoma, but you can see that really for both men and women, the, the incidence has decreased. And this we see 
regardless of uh, the acquisition of HIV, really for all groups they looked at, the incidence decreased during that time. This is a study from The Lancet from a couple years ago looking at causes of death among patients with HIV. And the light blue is non-AIDS cancer. So um, this is non-AIDS cancer. So it, the one thing that we need to, um, to recognize though, the AIDS defining cancers were not included in this category. So they were included in age-related disease where, so KS and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which are responsible for the bulk of malignancies were not included in the, in the cancer data here. Uh, as well, liver cancer was uh, included in the liver-related um, column rather than the malignancy-related column. So taken together, if you include the HIV associated, the AIDS-defining malignancies, the non-AIDS-defining malignancies, and then also liver-related uh, malignancy, it would be um, one of the highest ones on this in terms of the proportion. And fortunately, we're seeing for many causes of death, uh, both AIDS-related causes of death, liver-related causes of death, car cardiovascular-related causes of death, they're all going down over the past 20-some-odd years. But the, the cancer, again, is, uh, is really flatlined here. And that's what we're seeing now. And this again is a luxury that we have because patients because of antiretroviral therapy are living longer and uh, subsequently develop cancers that are more associated with aging as opposed to the immune system. That was among all comers. The same study looked at patients who's uh, in the, the, uh, the axis is slightly different. Um, this uh, looks at patients whose viral load was suppressed um, through the use of antiretroviral therapy and uh, the, the number of deaths responsible from cancer is decreased when the, the viral load is, is suppressed. But this was a study from the, the Journal of uh, Clinical Oncology from colleagues at the National Cancer Institute and this, they looked at the eight standard mortality rates in HIV infected versus HIV uninfected patients with cancer. And so we wanna look at in particular the, the cancer specific mortality, which is the, the blue bars on these graphs. And the paired, um, the paired columns are the patients who are HIV positive is the first one and HIV negative. HIV positive, HIV negative for a host of cancers. And really for most cancers, the cancer-specific mortality is higher among patients who are HIV infected compared to those who are HIV uninfected. Um, the pattern holds true for, for really all of these malignancies. And so what are the reasons for that? One of the reasons is disparities in care. HIV infected patients with cancer, as I just showed, have higher mortality compared to uninfected patients. And there's a number of reasons. One is delayed diagnoses. Two is they more commonly present at an advanced age. Three is immunosuppression, as was mentioned earlier. And four is a lack of appropriate treatment. And that really was independent of insurance status and comorbidities. And so why is there a lack of appropriate treatment for patients who are HIV positive? So there's a lot of uh, provider concerns, oncologist concerns about um, the data, we just don't have good data. Historically, patients with HIV have been excluded from clinical trials. And so there's some concern that um, the data that we have from clinical trials may not be applicable to patients who are HIV positive. And so the, the clinical trial data may not be generalizable to this population. There's also been historically a lack of cancer treatment guidelines. In um, oncology, a lot of what we do is very algorithmic and there's a lack of such algorithms for patients with HIV and cancer. And then finally, concerns about antiretroviral co-administration and whether or not such a combination would be too toxic for, for a patient. And so all this, I think, highlights the problem. The problem, there's an increasing public health need to treat cancer in patients with HIV, but the majority of oncology studies currently do not have entry criteria 
that allow for the appropriate selection of patients with, with HIV. Uh, this is uh, Tom Aldrich again. On behalf of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, they looked at HIV for, they looked at 46 new drug applications to the FDA, and they reviewed the eligibility criteria for those clinical trials of those 46. So 30 of the 46, or 65 percent, had exclusion criteria that did specifically excluded patients with HIV from participating in that trial. Um, in seven or 15 percent, there was not specific exclusion noted. In another nine or 20 percent, there was likely exclusion for active infection or explicit exclusion noted in other studies for the same agent. And in none of these studies were there specific HIV inclusion for patients with HIV. And so that group through the American Society of Clinical Oncology, they recognized given the advances we have in antiretroviral therapy, given the uh, improvements in um, cancer therapy and in antiretroviral therapy, that really we need to modernize clinical trial eligibility, that HIV by itself should not be an exclusion, that if a patient would be eligible for the trial independent of their HIV status, then they should be eligible for the trial um, with the HIV. And so this is not yet fully made it into clinical practice, but, and this was just from about six months ago, but our hope is that uh, these kinds of uh, recommendations will improve access to, to clinical trials more generally. And then with regard to guidelines, as I mentioned, again, much of cancer care is driven by algorithmic um, recipes for how to treat patients with cancer. And this was just put out just a two months ago, February 27, 2018 was the first version of a guidance document for how to care for patients with, who are living with, with HIV. And so hopefully the combination of improving access to clinical trials and this kind of guidance document, which is from the National Comprehensive Care Network for Cancer Network, will improve access and familiarity and comfort of providers caring for patients with HIV and cancer. So just to talk about the other concerns that patient, or providers sometimes have is the toxicity. And so in cancer care, there's really three modalities that we often use, radiation therapy, surgery, and systemic therapy. And in the pre-art era, there were some data that there was increased radiation-related toxicities, particularly if the CD4 count was less than 200. And so maybe we shouldn't uh, provide such therapy. But in the current era and with data that we have, if a patient is on, especially if their patient is on um, antiretrovirals, that radiation is effective and well tolerated. This is particularly important in the, the treatment and management of early stage lymphomas and also uh, cervical and anal cancer. And so the guidance now is when radiation therapy is indicated, HIV status alone should not be a criterion for decision making. Similarly with surgery, in the pre-art era, there was thought that surgery would be, could be uh, difficult for patients who are HIV positive, especially with a low viral load in their ability to uh, have adequate wound healing. But there's been a lot of data subsequently that shows that uh, surgery is effective with similar outcomes and complications between patients who are HIV positive and HIV negative. And again, when surgery is indicated, HIV status alone should not be a criterion for decision making. And then finally, systemic therapy. Initially, there was thought that we should limit the dose of chemotherapy depending on their baseline cellular immunodeficiency and their marrow function, and that the concomitant use of antiretroviral therapy and chemotherapy would be harmful. And now we know that standard dose chemotherapy with concurrent antiretroviral therapy is the standard of care, and that co-management between an oncologist and an HIV provider is, uh, is necessary. The concerns about systemic therapy, again, in large part have to do with drug-drug interactions. And so in addition uh, to a clinical oncologist and HIV specialist involving um, a clinical pharmacist uh, will be helpful. And it can go both ways. There's concern that um, Drug-drug interactions can lead to decreased exposure and reduced efficacy, 
For example, the NNRTIs can induce CYP3A, which would uh, decrease the exposure and the efficacy of the chemotherapy. And similarly, there's concern of increased exposure and increased toxicity. This we oftentimes see with the pharmacological boosters like ritonavir. And so because of this, we try to recommend the use of integrase inhibitors without boosters for the management of, of patients. Independent of the drug-drug interactions, we also have some concerns about overlapping toxicities. Some of the medications and RTIs and many chemotherapeutics cause neuropathy, they can cause neutropenia, and so trying to balance these toxicities um, is, is necessary. This is just uh, one um, example. This is from the MD Anderson of how they, um, how they manage their, uh, their balance, the, the benefits and the drug interactions between um, the antiretroviral therapy and, their, and the chemotherapy. And so, for example, um, the first one for the use of taxanes, which are commonly used uh, chemotherapies, if we use docetaxel, the retroviral regimen is changed from a ritonavir-boosted uh, darinavir to raltegravir. This is one example, and it also includes the, what we should do if patients are on antifungal therapy, for example. But different institutions have their, their own guidance. And again, the, the National Comprehensive Care Network has some recommendations on how to balance these drug-drug uh, interactions and the toxicities. And then the other clinical thing that is, uh, I think, particularly important is HIV testing in patients with cancer. So they did a retrospective cohort study of the years between 2004 and 2011 at MD Anderson of patients, adult patients with cancer who received systemic chemotherapy. Over 18,000 patients were, um, fit that, those criteria, and just over 3,500 were tested for HIV at initiation of cancer therapy. It's less than 20%. The prevalence of a positive HIV test result was just over 1%, and 0.3%, or 12 out of the 3,500, it was the, um, a newly diagnosed patient with HIV. And so this recommend, because of this, um, the National Concept Comprehensive Cancer Network supports the CDC recommendations that all patients who present for uh, care at a cancer center should be tested for HIV if they don't opt out. <coughs> so now I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the, a, a few specific cancers that we see um, disproportionately here at Harborview and in the Madison Clinic. And so we'll start with Kaposi sarcoma. There are four types uh, that are described for Kaposi sarcoma, a classic type, an endemic type, the classic type was seen in um, the Mediterranean area among males typically, endemic um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, transplantation associated, and epidemic or the AIDS associated. We'll focus on the AIDS associated here, but all of them are associated with the uh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus or HHV8. Again, this study that um, I briefly mentioned earlier in terms of the excess cancer burden there were 910 cases of KS among the 8,000, nearly 8,000 um, cancer diagnoses in 2010, and all of these were thought to be um, an excess cancer burden because of, of HIV. And even though the prevalence is decreasing here in the U.S., globally, Kaposi sarcoma remains the most common malignancy in people living with HIV. Again, at the Uganda Cancer Institute, where we work, it's the leading cause of, of cancer. And Warren Phipps, who's associated with the University of Washington, has done a lot of work in this effort um, in Uganda. Kaposi sarcoma can present um, in multiple ways. It can have mucocutaneous, pulmonary, lymph node, and GI involvement. And typically, the symptoms are associated with the, the site of involvement. It can present with uh, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, if there's pulmonary involvement, weight loss, and abdominal pain if it uh, presents with GI involvement, and sometimes it can have, um, uh, you know, commonly it has skin manifestations, which can cause a lot of uh, um, discomfort as well. And so these are just uh, three pictures. Um, again, it has a predilection for the um, oral cavity. It can cause um, what we describe as woody edema, 
and then uh, multiple cutaneous lesions um, in this patient. And histologically, so we try to get a biopsy, it's characterized by these spindle cells that are in sort of a vascular area, a hypervascular area. And these are just um, the, um, the KSHV LANA stain for the um, uh, nuclear antigen showing the um, by immunohistochemistry, confirming a diagnosis of Kaposi's sarcoma. We stage um, all cancers, but Kaposi's sarcoma is staged a little differently than the typical ways we stage it. It's uh, staged via the AIDS clinical trial group staging system, which characterizes the tumor, the immune system, and whether there's systemic symptoms. So if the tumor is confined to the skin or lymph nodes, or even maybe limited oral disease, it is stage T0. Otherwise, it's T1 disease. The immune system, if, it's, uh, if the patient has a CD4 count greater than 200, it's a zero. Otherwise, if it's less than 200, it's uh, one. And if there's systemic symptoms, if there are no systemic symptoms, so no uh, opportunistic infections, no B symptoms, fever, uh, chills, night sweats, or um, greater than 10% weight loss, or if there's no, this, this is shot, actually should be good performance status. If there's no, if the patient has a good performance status, it should, it's S0, otherwise it's S1. And the treatment for Kaposi sarcoma, the initial treatment really is antiretroviral therapy. And within months, it varies, but between 20 and 80% will have a response just to the antiretroviral therapy. In a small portion of patients, the initiation of antiretroviral therapy in patients with Kaposi sarcoma will result in immune reconstitution, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, or IRIS. And typically, this is seen in patients with a high HIV viral load and a high KSHV viral load. But the initial treatment is antiretroviral therapy. And then if the patient has extensive skin involvement, you know, 25 or so, lesions or this woody edema, if they have visceral involvement in their lungs typically or the GI system, or if they have iris, then we uh, recommend treatment with, with uh, systemic therapy, with uh, chemotherapy. And so the standard chemotherapy is liposomal doxorubicin. We give it on a every three week cycle and it rel is relatively well tolerated. Its response rate is about 45%. Much of this is a partial response and not a complete response, but it does alleviate symptoms. Paclitaxel, which uh, is a taxane, which we talked about earlier, which has some drug-drug interactions, it actually may be slightly more effective in terms of response rate, but again, it, much of this response is a partial response and not a complete response but the side effects are significantly greater with uh, neuropathy, neutropenia, and alopecia. And it's really um, the second line therapy that we give. And then pomalinamide or lenalinamide is a oral agent that we now have some data to use in the relapse refractory setting. And this was a study from colleagues at the National Cancer Institute using um, pomalidomide, which is a immunomodulatory agent in similar, it's a cousin of thalidomide or lenalidomide that revealed an overall response rate of 75%. And if you look at these, this plot, it really shows for the majority of patients, in this study looked at both HIV positive and HIV negative patients, but for the majority of patients, it had a significant decrease. So this is change in baseline. So for a number of patients, the, the change in the nodular lesions or in the total number of lesions really was, was resolved. So it's, uh, it is uh, an attractive medication. And there's some uh, use of this medication now in clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the use of an oral therapy would be favored as, to, as opposed to IV therapy. And again, fortunately, the, the number and the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma has continued to, to decrease. So I'm going to switch to HIV-associated lymphomas. Again, um, there are some lymphomas that are AIDS-defining, and there are some that are non-AIDS-defining. The initial definition of the lymphomas associated with AIDS, to make that definition, really were Burkitt lymphoma, immunoblastic lymphoma, 
which is a aggressive lymphoma that typically affects the, the jaw and primary CNS lymphoma. But we've had a lot of changes in terms of the definition of lymphoma from the World Health Organization and how we classify lymphomas. So now really all aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas arising in patients with HIV are considered AIDS-defined, not simply these three. And the other type of lymphoma we see is Hodgkin lymphoma. And there's a significantly increased risk of patients um, with HIV developing Hodgkin lymphoma, but it is not AIDS-defining. And again, in the same paper, it was found that 88% of, uh, there's an excess burden of 88% for patients with uh, HIV and with regard to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The risk factors are not surprisingly a low CD4 count. So patients with a CD4 count less than 50 had a 15 times greater risk of developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma compared to those with a CD4 count greater than 500 and a, and a high HIV viral load. The symptoms are typically painless adenopathy, B symptoms we mentioned, fever, chills, night sweats, weight loss. And it's been in different studies between five and 15% the etiology of fever of unknown origin on patients with HIV. It can present as extranodal disease and we oftentimes see involvement of uncommon locations. There's a body cavity lymphoma in the GI tract and soft tissue. The diagnosis is made histologically. We try to get an excisional lymph node if we can. And it's, uh, we categorize um, lymphomas not just in the HIV population, but in the general population as well as a germinal center type of lymphoma or an activated B cell type of lymphoma. Typically, the, the germinal center type of lymphoma is um, patients have a relatively milder immunodeficiency with a moderate CD4 count. This is a relatively good prognosis um, lymphoma. And the two characteristic ones are the um, is Burkitt's lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma of the centroblastic variety. These are both CD20 positive, and that's important because we have a monoclonal antibody that can target the CD20 antigen. And these are plus or minus EBV um, positive. The, the malignancies with the poorer prognosis are an immunoblastic type of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, a primary effusion lymphoma, and a plasmablastic lymphoma. Primary effusion lymphoma and plasmablastic lymphoma are CD20 negative, so we, don't, we can't use rituximab, which is an effective medication. Um, and they're all EBV positive and oftentimes HHV8 uh, positive for both the primary effusion lymphoma and plasmablastic lymphoma. Again, these are ones that are associated with more severe immunodeficiency, a lower CD4 count, and unfortunately, a, a poor prognosis. The treatment for the lymphoma is really based on the histologic subtype. It typically will involve combination chemotherapy. And uh, I'm sure you're, you've seen these different acronyms, but really the acronym is dependent on the, the type of, um, of cancer we have. And it's important to use concurrent antiretroviral therapy, which has shown to, to decrease the incidence of opportunistic infections and improves overall survival. This was a study, again, from colleagues at the National Cancer Institute, where they used this regimen, which is dose-adjusted EPOC. It is what we use um, typically as a regimen of CHOP, which is four different medications. This is an additional medication, this E, which is a toposide. And unlike CHOP, which is given through, um, is an IV medication, this regimen is an infusional regimen where they get the medication continuously. And there's some thought that uh, an infusional regimen may be better stochiastically for patients with HIV or aggressive lymphomas. And so they showed in this study that the progression-free survival and the overall survival using this regimen at the NCI NEUA was quite good. And really it was dependent on CD4 count. So if the CD4 count was greater than 100, the, um, the, the overall survival was close to 90% whereas if the CD4 count was, was uh, less than 100, it had uh, a much poorer prognosis. There are some things that we do specifically, though, with patients who are HIV positive. 
we do have to use some caution with the use of the monoclonal antibody rituximab in patients who are CD50, uh, CD4 with a count less than 50 because of um, the signal of increased infections. We typically will provide growth factor support through GCSF. And then depending on the organ or depending on the regimen, we will uh, recommend prophylaxis for PJP or MAC, depending on the CD4 count, for fungal infection, for viral infections, and for enteric organisms if a patient is neutropenic. And again, NHL is decreasing as well. And the third cancer I'd like to just uh, talk about is anal cancer. Unlike non-Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, Kaposi sarcoma, the incidence of anal cancer is rising. The risk factors, in addition to HIV, it's an HPV-related malignancy. It's associated with smoking and men who have sex with men. The majority of anal cancers, just like the, for the other two cancers we discussed, are in excess. And interestingly, 71% of those among those living five or more years since the AIDS onset, it was an excess burden. And because of the role of HPV and because of a precursor lesions that we see with anal cancer, there may be a role for screening. And we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, so that we show. So again, anal cancer develops from a precursor lesion, similar, um, it's analogous to HPV and cervical cancer. It, ha it goes through, um, intraepithelial neoplasia one, two, and three, similar to cervical cancer. AIN1 is a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and two and three are higher grades. The histology is typically squamous cell, and the treatment is chemotherapy plus radiation therapy. So I'll talk about screening in a second, but one of the things that uh, we discussed earlier was the need for clinical trials because patients with HIV have historically been excluded from uh, clinical trial participation. And so that's really why the AIDS Malignancy Consortium was, um, was started, where Dr. Harrington and I and Dr. Brody here uh, at Harborview work on these trials. And so the AIDS Malignancy Consortium is a National Cancer Institute supported clinical trials group founded in 1995 and it's to support innovative trials for AIDS-related cancer, and it's composed of over 35 clinical trial sites uh, around the world. And so we see it in the United States, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Uganda, where we work, in India, Australia, and, um, and Latin America. And so it is a global consortium. And there's different working groups, and these working groups really help uh, define what is the area of clinical investigation that should be studied. And the groups are KS, lymphoma, uh, HPV-related cancers, and the non-AIDS-defining cancers. In Seattle, we're lucky. Harborview is one site, as is the Fred Hutch, but also we have colleagues at the Poly Clinic and Virginia Mason Medical Center who have uh, clinical trials for patients who are HIV positive through this clinical consortium. Some of the trials that we have available at one site may not be available at the other site, but it's nice that we have this, uh, this collaboration with the, with the other centers locally. And so I'm just gonna touch on a couple of the, the treatment studies that we have available here. The first one um, is regarding screening of anal cancer. It's a national study called the ANCHOR study or anal cancer uh, HCL outcomes research study. And this is uh, currently available at Virginia Mason, at Harborview, and at the Poly Clinic. And so the, the question is, the research question is, does treatment of anal uh, high cell or these precancerous cells prevent the development of anal cancer? This was uh, a similar question that was asked prior to the introduction of the pap smear. And so for cervical cancer, it's a multi-centered phase three randomized trial with the hope of enrolling 5,000 patients. Um, and so patients will be randomized to active monitoring or without treatment of uh, HISOL or treatment of HISOL. And um, it's important to recognize some patients with these precancerous cells, they, there will be spontaneous regression. And so it may not be necessary to treat all these patients similar to um, cervical cancer. And so this study entails a screening visit where a patient will have an anal pap smear 
and uh, high resolution anoscopy with biopsies. They are followed every six months with the same procedure. They get active, the active monitoring group will have annual biopsies. The treatment group gets treated with a topical agent um, and potentially uh, electrocautery or surgery. And there is a um, uh, study visits are um, for five years and patients are paid $100 per visit to, to participate. And again, this is for HIV positive men and women who are um, greater than 35 years old. And the hope is to see if it prevents the development of invasive anal cancer. We also have a study of the use of brintuximab vodoitin in patients with HIV and advanced age um, Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, brintuximab is an agent just like rituximab targets CD20. Brintuximab targets CD30. And this is a cell that we see in um, in Hodgkin lymphoma. This was just um, not in an HIV population, but in, in all comers, this medication was shown to be quite effective in the use of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. And it was just published in December of last year. It, and it's potentially a practice changing medication. But this study assesses whether it will be also useful and tolerated for patients with HIV. We're trying to open up a study, both at Virginia Mason and here, on the use of abrutinib, which is an oral agent, plus the, the therapy that we showed was effective from the National Cancer Institute, this EPOC infusional regimen for patients with uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Again, there's um, one of the advantages of the AIDS malignancy clinical trial is so that we can test agents that potentially are effective against both the virus as well as the malignancy. And so there's some thought that abrutinib, this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, may be effective against the virus. Um, this is another agent. Um, it's a fusion protein. We're not having this at uh, Harborview. It's going to be offered at uh, Virginia Mason. But it's looking at um, an agent that may stop the blood vessel growth of patients with Kaposi sarcoma. It's a vascular tumor, and so agents which stop um, uh, blood vessel uh, formation may be, may be effective. And then the last KS study here is using a protease inhibitor, nelfinavir, which you all are more familiar with than I am, but giving a high dose of this medication and assessing whether it can um, inhibit cell growth. This is, uh, there's a number of colleagues locally who have been involved in the development of this, uh, this pilot study, including um, Warren Phipps, uh, Soren Gant, who used to be here, and Rachel Bender-Ignacio. And then the final study is the use of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy really has changed the landscape of oncologic care using really harnessing the body's immune system to, to target cancer. And so this is a study looking at two particular immunotherapeutic agents to see how it can affect the, the malignancy and potentially um, HIV. There's some work um, here at Harborview, not specific to HIV, but the effect of, of these kinds of agents on the HIV latent reservoir. And really, you can't get away from reading a New England Journal of Medicine article without talking about immunotherapy. This is from um, April 16th, so yesterday's uh, New England Journal, where there's three studies on the use of immunotherapy um, for the use of lung cancer. Initially, it was used for, um, for advanced disease, and a couple of these studies show that, well, maybe it'd be helpful to use in earlier stage disease as well. Um, and so we are finding multiple, um, multiple uses of this medication or these types of medication. And again, it just shows the benefit of trying to really harness the immune system in the care of patients with cancer. And then finally, uh, prevention. So there's a number of things we can do to prevent. Obviously, early diagnosis and treatment of patients with antiretroviral therapy would help. Um, we'd like to follow the CDC and the NCCN recommendation of universal testing. We know the risk of cancer is reduced among those who, who uh, initiated rather uh, antiretroviral therapy with a CD4 count greater than 500 compared to those who initiated at less than 350. There was a 50% reduction in non-AIDS-defining cancers. 
a 90% reduction in Kaposi sarcoma and a 70% reduction in lymphoma just by the initiation early of antiretrovirals. Vaccinations for HPV and hepatitis B, smoking cessation, and then age-appropriate cancer screening. And so I hope I was able to, to show today that HIV and cancer, so there's an increased risk of development of cancer for patients who are HIV positive, that disparities unfortunately persist, that most patients who develop cancer should be offered the same cancer therapies as HIV negative individuals, including participation in clinical trials, and that patients should be co-managed with an oncologist and an HIV specialist. So um, thank you in particular to Dr. Brody, Dr. Casper, uh, Dr. Harrington, Dr. Aldrich, and uh, Dr. Wong. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, both from here or the audience, or from... Showed uh, for the for the treatment of um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that there was a dramatic difference in outcome for people who took drugs at over 100 and less than 100. Do you think that so? Do you think that survival difference is due to less effectiveness of the chemotherapy or more toxicity that's realized by people who take the same amount? Or what's that? I think it's both of those, but I think also. Uh, thank you. Um, the question is what the, what the cause of the disparity is between patients who have a CD4 count greater than 100 versus less than 100 among patients who receive that infusional regimen of dose-adjusted EPOC for the treatment of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And I think there's a variety of things. One is the immune system itself, but importantly, I think oncologists have been hesitant to give the same kind of doses of medication for patients who have um, a low CD4 count. And actually that regimen, by definition, we do have to dose, reduce. It's, um, it's called dose-adjusted EPOC. We actually adjust the doses of the medication based on their neutrophil count and their white count. And so they probably get less, patients who have a lower white count get a, lo a lower total dose of the medication. And we know that dose is important for, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as it is for most cancers. Sylvia. I had a question. Given the, the morbidity and mortality associated with HPV-related infections and chronic illness in adults, um, especially from in Uganda and other uh, Eastern African countries that we work in, um, has there been more of a push to expand the world of HPV treatment to include people who have a cancer that they are more susceptible to the disease and other types of infections? So the question was, given the um, the increased risk of, of uh, cervical cancer in low-income areas, well, or HPV-related HPV related cancers in um, both here and in low-income countries, the role of uh, improved access to vaccinations. And so the difficulty historically with the HPV vaccine is we know it's effective, but it requires three doses of a medication given to an age group that is not so easy to uh, to intervene with at three points in time. And so that's been one of the fundamental difficulties, but we have been shown, there have been more recent studies that showed, well, maybe three doses is not necessary. Maybe we can do it with two doses, and two doses seems to be effective. Maybe we can do it with one dose. So if that can happen, that I think will improve access and utilization. And then two, it's still a pretty expensive medication, uh, vaccine, despite uh, you know, external support, it's still, um, unfortunately cost prohibitive in many areas. But there is efforts, I think, in the global community to try to improve access to, um, to the vaccine. And in countries that do, I mean, Australia actually has done a very good job of uh, providing coverage for both boys and girls, men and women, with uh, the vaccine. And increasingly in the US, I mean, six or five years ago, the uptake of the three dose of the vaccine in the US was quite poor. It was about 30%, and now it's significantly higher. So I think there is a role, and hopefully it will be improved in the future, the vaccine. Thank you.
Sure. So the question was uh, about the um, participation in clinical trials outside the U.S., particularly in Uganda, given some um, potential barriers to enrollment. In Uganda, actually, so the Fred Hutch has a relationship with the Uganda Cancer Institute, which is a cancer institute that's been in existence for over 50 years. It actually has a history of clinical investigation. It was the first site, one of the first sites globally, to show the effectiveness of combination chemotherapy back in the late 60s, early 70s. There was actually colleagues from the National Cancer Institute who went to Uganda, who lived in Uganda, who worked on clinical trials showing the effectiveness of combination chemotherapy for the treatment of Burkitt lymphoma. And so the motto of the Uganda Cancer Institute is research is our resource. So there's this long history of clinical investigation at the Uganda Cancer Institute. And because of that, I think enrollment in clinical trials, actually the participation has been pretty high. Now there haven't been many therapeutic clinical trials at the Uganda Cancer Institute more recently. There's a lot of, there are, um, so Warren Phipps has a, a trial for patients with, um, for Kaposi sarcoma. There have been um, observational studies, but the enrollment there is quite high. It's over 90% of eligible patients will participate in a trial at the Uganda Cancer Institute. Again, historically, these haven't been as many therapeutic trials, but I think given the emphasis of the center, it has been, uh, it's been very good, better than many places here in the US. Now, that one center is likely not representative of the whole area for the whole country and in other parts of, of Sub-Saharan Africa. But in Uganda, they do quite well. There's one more question about so these dramatic new immunotherapies that kind of unleash the immune system to attack the cancer. Is there any early data that they'll be less effective in people that are immunocompromised to start with? So the question was the use of immunotherapy for patients who are immunocompromised and the effectiveness. So we have just a few signals thus far. Um, one, we have to make sure they're, they're safe. Are these medications safe? And it looks like all the signals are that they are safe and well tolerated um, among patients with HIV. So there's a trial through the Cancer Immunotherapy Network, CITN, that just presented some data in February of this year looking at the safety signal. I mean, it's too early to show efficacy, though anecdotally there is efficacy, but it is, uh, it's, it's shown to be safe. And there was a recent, and I, just in terms of time, I took it out, but there was a recent article in the past couple of weeks in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology where they looked at seven or nine patients who had lung cancer in Boston and the use of this agent. And it was uh, well tolerated and, uh, and effective. There's actually some thought that these medications may be more effective in patients who are HIV positive because uh, patients who experience chronic um, antigen stimulation as uh, a virus can do may upregulate PD-1, and PD-1 is the target of these medications. So the thought is that potentially these medications may be even more effective um, in HIV-positive population, but we, we don't have that clinical data as yet. Well, thank you. I think we're at time. I'm happy to answer any questions at the here or wherever at the end, but thank you for your time. <laughs>